So uh, Marco got his PhD from Duke University. Uh, he's been a faculty at Virginia Tech in the Department of Statistics for, I don't know, what, five or six years now? Yeah, it's, it's going to be eight years. Oh, wow. Yeah, time flies. Uh, before that, he was at uh, University of Missouri, Columbia. Um, he served uh, between 2016 and 2020 as the director for the graduate program at Virginia Tech. Uh, Marco has advised uh, 10 PhD students and postdocs and published over 50 scientific papers and two books. And uh, his students and postdocs have taken jobs in academia, industry, and government uh, positions. So it is a pleasure to have him around, and uh, I'm really looking forward to the talk. All right, awesome. Thank you, Abel, for the nice introduction, and also thank you for the invitation to give this talk. Uh, it's a pleasure to be talking uh, for you guys from the University of Washington. And I'm going to talk about some models that uh, were uh, proposed by Julian Bizag, who was a faculty at the University of Washington uh, some time ago. So. Yeah, so I'm going to talk about objective Bayesian model selection for Gaussian hierarchical models with BZAG's ICAR special random effects. And this is joint work with uh, my colleague, Chris Frank, and our joint uh, PhD student, Erica Porter. All right, so this is an outline, and there are lots and lots of points here. So I'm going to go pretty fast through some of them. So I'm going to start with some motivating example. So it's the analysis of spatial data. And then after that, I'm going to talk about the hierarchical model that's usually used for that spatial data. Um, and after that, I'm going to talk about something related to the BZAG ICAR priors that are the sum zero constrained ICAR priors that we came up with. After that, I'm going to talk about Bayesian model selection, prior specification, uh, fractional base factor, uh, FFBF, uh, FBF training fraction, how to perform fast computations in this uh, for these models. Then I'm going to talk about some results from a simulation study and then go back to the application, which is the logarithm of median household income. Um, so, and then I'll conclude. So motivating example. So here's um, a motivating example. On the top left, we have the map of the United States with the log income per county in 2017. Log uh, median household income, okay? And then on the top right, we have the logarithm of the population on the bottom left, we have the logarithm of unemployment. And then on the bottom right, we have the type of metropolitan area. And what we would like to do would be to fit a model for log income uh, as the dependent variable with these other variables as the explanatory variables. And uh, we want to... Um, perform model selection. So decide which uh, variables to include or not in the model. So usually we're going to follow, use the following hierarchical model. So here, uh, Y is a vector that has the res response variable. X is a matrix of covariates. Beta is a vector of regression coefficients. Phi is a vector of spatial random effects that are going to follow a sum zero constraint intrinsic car prior. And theta is a, in the spatial stats literature, we call this a vector of unstructured random effects. But, uh, you know, in the uh, mixed, mixed linear, linear mixed models uh, literature, this would be just the error term. Okay. So theta would be the vector of error terms. Theta one, et cetera, theta n are IID normal mean zero variance sigma squared. And uh, phi and theta are assumed to be independent priori. <clears throat> so now let me tell you a little bit about what we mean by some zero constraint I car prior. So the I car prior, 
in intrinsic condition autoregressive uh, prior is a prior for that that assumes a Markovian structure. So it assumes, so in this particular case, we're assuming that the run the spatial random effects for, for example, for this black subregion here, uh, conditional on its neighbors is going to be independent of the rest of the fields. So, and we may have um, first order neighborhood, which would be this purple um, subregions, um, second order neighborhood that would include this diagonally uh, located subregions and so on and so forth. So essentially we have a model for the spatial random effects that's based on the neighborhood, on a neighborhood structure. So uh, here is the typical way to write, the, to write down this joint density for this vector of intrinsic car random effects. And here, instead of phi, I'm calling them omega. And there's a reason for that. So this is what um, is in the paper by Bizag et al. in 1991. And it's here. It's a density that, but it's defined up to a positive, up up to a constant. Okay, so we have e to the power of minus tau omega over two omega transpose h omega, where this h matrix is a symmetric matrix, but it's not a, a positive definite matrix. It's a positive semi-definite precision matrix. Okay. Because of that, it doesn't have a, a usual inverse. So here, Hij is defined as Hi if i is equal to j. So these are the h the Hi's are the elements in the diagonal of this matrix. The off diagonal elements are either zero if the subregions i and j are not neighbors or it's going to be equal to minus gij if phi is in the neighborhood of subregion j. Now this tau omega is larger than zero is a precision parameter. Uh, gij is larger or equal than zero as a measure of how similar the subregions i and j are. And gij is equal to gji. And hi, the elements in the diagonal are just the sum <clears throat> are equal, hi is equal to minus the sum of the di of diagonal elements of that row i. Now, uh, one thing that we did uh, in 2018, we proposed this sum zero constraint at car prior, uh, which is a prior for phi for that um, vector of spatial random effects is a multivariate Gaussian distribution with a mean vector of zeros. The covariance matrix is sigma squared. The sigma squared is the variance of the error term in that um, linear mixed model divided by tau. And all of this multiplied by h plus, where h plus is the more Penrose inverse of h. So we, we derived this model by considering up, this is an improper model, by considering a proper version of this model and then imposing the sum zero constraint and then uh, making the propriety parameter go to zero, which should make the, the proper model considered by this become improper, but if we impose the sum zero constraint, then this is what we get. Uh, if we impose the sum zero constraint before sending that prior, uh, parameter to zero. Okay. And the cool thing about this is that the prior density is well defined. So the constant of proportionality is well defined. And, and here, uh, it depends on the order. It depends on the eigenvalues of that matrix H. Okay, and well, to perform model selection, we need a well-defined constant of uh, constant of proportionality for this model. Okay. 
so here is a new result from this paper that uh, we have submitted. So if we simulate omega conditional on uh, the sum of the omegas being zero from the co full conditional distribution that's implied by the improper I car, that's equivalent to simulating from the full conditional distribution for phi implied by our sum zero constraint prior. And some previous results from uh, uh, a couple of other of our papers. So this distribution, the sum zero constraint I car prior is the stationary distribution of a one at a time Gibbs sampler. If it's applied to the improper I car prior with centering on the fly at the end of each iteration. Uh, and then this is another result that's, that seems to be similar to this other result on top, but it's a little different. So it's centering special random effects omega simulated from the full condition distribution implied by the improper I car. So if you consider what is the full conditional distribution implied by the improper I car, you can actually simulate from that. And then if you simulate from that and then you center the special random effects, that's equivalent to simulating from the full condition distribution for phi implied by our sum zero constraint um, I car prior. So essentially these results uh, tell us that um, our sum zero constraint I car prior is uh, equivalent to BZAG's I car priors. As long as you are performing this sum zero constraint to the BZAG's I car priors. Okay, Bayesian model selection. So first let me um, talk a, a little bit in general about Bayesian model selection. And, and I know that many uh, people uh, in the department uh, know about this, but just to um, establish notation. So let's say that we have C models, M1, et cetera, MC, and then different models may have different covariates or different spatial dependence structure. So for example, with or without ICAR spatial random effects, or maybe we have, um, instead of ICAR spatial random effects, we may have uh, simultaneous autoregressive random effects. So SAR spatial random, random effects. Uh, let eta C be the parameter vector for model MC and then let P of MC be the prior probability of model MC. And now let cons let's consider this likelihood function for model MC. So it's P of Y given eta C and MC. Finally, we also need a prior density for eta C to perform Bayesian model selection. And then if we have all of these ingredients, and if this prior density here is uh, proper density, then Bayesian model selection is going to rely on these integrated likelihoods of this form. Um, if we want to compare two models, MC and ML, then we can use base, uh, the base factor, BFCL, which is the ratio of the integrated likelihoods under model C and under model L. And then by Bayes theorem, we can compute the posterior probability of model MR just again, using Bayes theorem. So the posterior probability of model MR is going to be proportional to the integrated likelihood under model MR times the prior probability of model MR. Now prior specification. So we, we need to specify, we need to specify two things. The prior probabilities for the several models, PM1, et cetera, PMC, and the prior densities for the parameters under each model. Uh, for assigning those prior probabilities, we use the recommendations from Scott and Berger. And <clears throat> essentially, and, and we also, we are also going to allow for either independence or spatial dependence. So we're going to split the prior probability in half for independence and for half for spatial dependence. If we include uh, SAR spatial random effects as a possibility, then independence is going to have probability a half, and then one fourth is going to go for the ICAR 
prior and one fourth is going to go to the um, to the uh, sour prior. Now, if you just have independence or um, a, a night car prior, then you're going to have a half and a half. And then the prior probability for a model MC with KC covariates is going to be this uh, prior probability. Now, assignment of prior densities for the parameters is a lot more delicate, okay? So if we assign proper priors for all the parameters, then we get a, a, a well-defined base factor. However, it is not trivial to specify sensible priors for the, for the spatial dependence models. <clears throat> and, and the other thing is that uh, it's well known that these factors are sensitive to the uh, specification of the priors. So one possible solution is to use reference priors for model parameters, and that's what we, use, what we do here. And in 2019, we derived a reference prior for that uh, hierarchical model, and that reference prior uh, is of this form. And it's a prior for beta, sigma squared, and tau. It's proportional to some prior for tau, which is actually a, a proper prior for tau, divided by sigma squared to the power of a. And a is a hyperparameter. So it just turns out that the reference prior, the Jeffers prior, and the independence Jeffers prior all have this form with different uh, expressions for pi tau and with different values of a but we have found that the reference prior is, um, works much better than the other priors. Here is just the expression of the reference prior. So we have this projection matrix G star and then Q star uh, is the matrix that column that has as columns, the normalized eigenvectors corresponding to the known zero eigenvalues of G star. And then we take this G star Oh, we take this Q star and then we compute Q star transpose times the Moore Penrose inverse of H times Q star. We compute the ordered eigenvalues of this, and then the reference prior has A equal to one, and pi, uh, the prior for tau, has this expression here. So this is the prior that we use. And then you can see that the prior is. The, the pi, the, the reference prior pi tau is proper, but the prior for beta and sigma squared is not proper, okay? So um, <clears throat> now improper priors for the parameters of the computing models is going to lead to base factors that are defined only to, only up to undefined constants. And this is a, a, a problem that's well known in the Bayesian model selection literature. So, and here is just an example of, of what happens. So to solve that problem, what we do is we use a fractional base factor approach. So, and fractional base factors were proposed by Tony O'Hagan in 1995. Uh, and the main idea is that we use a fraction of the likelihood function to train the reference prior. And then we use that trained prior and the remaining fraction of the likelihood function to compute the integrated likelihood. And a cool thing is that the fractional base factor will, uh, will make that uh, undefined normalizing constant to cancel out. Um, so for example, let B be equal to M divided by N. N is the sample size and M is like the equivalent number of uh, observations that would be used for this training, okay? <clears throat> so the, then the updated prior that we're uh, denoting as uh, pi star eta C is going to be proportional to the original reference prior times the likelihood function raised to the power of B, okay? 
<clears throat> and then the fractional integrator likelihood for a model MC is going to be equal to the integral of this updated prior times the likelihood function raised to the remain to the remaining fraction one minus b integral with respect to a to c and then the fractional base factor for model m1 versus model m2 is just going to be the ratio of this um, fractionally integrated likelihoods And one thing that we can do in term for computation is we can rewrite the fractional base factor in this way. And then we have that, no, not the fractional base factor. We can rewrite the fraction integrated likelihood this way. And then uh, we can see that we can compute that fraction integrated likelihood as, as this ratio. Uh, in the case of hierarchical models with ICAR spatial random effects, we have this expression here uh, for for the uh, for this integral of the likelihood function to the power of b times the prior for eta. All right, so what training fraction should we use? So we have a result that says that um, the minimal training size for this fractional base factor to be well-defined is uh, m equal to p plus one. So here we're, we're restricting ourselves to uh, positive integer m's. Um, how, how much time do I have? It's only, uh, 357. So you still got about 30, uh, 20 minutes left. Oh, wow. I'm going yeah. so fast. <laughs> <laughs> I, okay. I should, I should be, I should be keeping track of time because I'm going so fast. Are there any questions so far? Yeah, so when we don't have an audience, we just you know, go too fast. Okay, fast computations. So, um, all right, so, so H again, is that precision matrix that um, that de essentially defines the, the that that that's the precision matrix for the for the ICAR prior. So if we take the that precision matrix and we compute the spectral decomposition, so H equal to P D P transpose. Here P is the uh, matrix that has as columns the normalized the normalized eigenvectors of h okay and then d is a diagonal matrix that has diagonal elements d1 d2 etc dn that are the ordered eigenvalues of the matrix h and now you can see um so the, the last eigenvalue here is zero okay now what we're going to do is we're going to transform both the data, the dependent variable vector and the matrix of, of uh, regressors and the spatial uh, vector of spatial random effects in the vector of errors using this uh, P matrix. So essentially we're going to pre-multiply the data vector by uh, p transpose pre-multiply the um, this should not have a star here pre-multiply the matrix of uh, of regressors by p transpose pre-multiply phi by p transpose and pre-multiply theta by p transpose so now we have this script y script x psi and this other letter here that i forgot the name um, 
And then with that, you can rewrite the hierarchical model in this way here. So y is equal to, so script y is equal to script x times beta plus psi times this vector of errors. The vector of errors still has, because, because p is uh, orthonormal, uh, so the vector of errors still has a normal, multivariate normal distribution with mean zero, and varies that sigma squared times the identity matrix. Now, this vector psi is the vector of spatial random effects, but in the spectral domain. And conditional sigma squared and tau is going to have a multivariate normal distribution with a mean vector of zeros. And with a covariance matrix, that's sigma squared times tau to minus one times the more Penrose inverse of the matrix D. So it's, it's essentially going to be, um, so D is like this. So D plus is going to be the reciprocal of D1, is going to be a diagonal matrix with the reciprocal of D1, the reciprocal of D2, et cetera, the reciprocal of D n minus one, and then the last element is going to be zero. And now both the error vector and the spectral, spectral domain spatial random effects have diagonal covariance matrices. And then when we do that, then uh, the analysis on this spectral domain model is going to be much simpler, faster, and more scalable. Just to um, demonstrate that, here is a, a, a plot that comes from our paper that we published last year. Uh, so this is computational time of 10 regressors uh, for the folks who do uh, spatial data analysis and in particular spatial data, data analysis for aerial data. Uh, you guys will know INLA. And uh, here we have timing uh, for estimation and for model selection. La on the left, estimation, and this is in seconds. So uh, the dashed line is INLA, which at the time that we published our paper was like the fastest way of doing analysis for this, for, for that uh, spatial uh, model. Uh, the, da the dotted line here, is uh, uh, what we call a spectral Gibbs sampler. So it's doing uh, Gibbs sampling in the spectral domain, which is slower than INLA, but it's still much faster than Gibbs sampler in the original domain. And then in uh, solid black here is what we call the um, spectral posterior maximizer. Uh, so essentially both INLA and this SPM are doing maximization. The, the things that when, when we are fitting just one model and we're using the, the model in the spectral domain, so essentially all the operations after we do this spectral domain, uh, spectral, after we transform to the spectral domain, all these operations uh, grow linearly with sample size, the operation. And so uh, we do not need to be computing uh, inverses of matrices or Koleski de um, or determinants of matrices at each iteration of the optimization procedure. Whereas INLA uh, needs to compute, you know, whatever, uh, matrix decomposition approach they use. They use a very smart matrix decomposition approach um, and that's like a Koleski decomposition based on uh, for, for sparse matrices. But they, my understanding, at least at that time, when we did these computations is that they, they implement that, uh, they have implemented that algorithm themselves. Whereas here we're using, um, an optimized, um, optimized library to, to perform this uh, spectral decomposition. And that optimized library 
uses the um, that uses the um, the vector operations that the uh, the processor can can perform. So so it's it's using uh, highly optimized computations that are available, you know, for anybody using R, as long as you either uh, compile R with OpenBLAS or with uh, Intel MKL. On the right, the difference in, in, in computational time is even uh, more dramatic. So we have um, model selection. So if we have 10 regressors, we have 1,024 possible models. Uh, and with our procedure, we can actually compute, uh, fit all 1,024 possible models and, and then form the, the posterior probabilities of all those models. And then SPM here has negligible computational time compared with INLA because INLA still needs to perform all the matrix, the, uh, the compositions uh, for each possible model. Whereas this spectral domain computations, we just need to compute the, uh, the uh, spectral decomposition of the each matrix once before we fit all the models. Okay. All right, here are, are the results of a simulation study. Here are the settings. N is equal to 100, 400, 900. So we considered three sample sizes. Uh, sigma squared, we fixed at one. Tau, we consider 0.01, which is very high spatial dependence. 0.1, which is about the spatial dependence that I see in most data, uh, spatial data sets that I uh, analyzed. One, which is kind of weak spatial dependence and infinite, which corresponds to indep the independent model. Uh, we consider uh, an X matrix that corresponds to an intercept and five covariates, where the covariates, uh, so the intercept here has value five. Uh, the, the first covariate has co uh, regression coefficient two, second covariate has regression coefficient one, and the other three covariates are not really in the model, or they're just for us to see if we, if we select the model correctly. And uh, many, many spatial applications are such that the, the covariates are spatially correlated. And, and that creates quite a bit of trouble for usual model selection methods, and sometimes for estimation methods too. So here we simulated the covariates with mean zero, sigma squared equal to one, and spatial, uh, strong spatial correlation, tau equal to 0.1, okay? And we're going to see how that uh, affects competing model selection criteria, DIC and WASC, and how that affects our, uh, our uh, fractional base factor based procedure using the reference prior. And all these results are based on 100 simulated data sets under each setting. So first we are looking just at results for our procedure. So this is the posterior probability of uh, inclusion of each covariate. So we have five covariates and this is for tau varying from 0 0.01, 0 0.1, 1 and infinite. So I can see that, uh, and this is for sample size 100. So I can see that, um, <clears throat> so we have box plots here. You can see that X1 is being uh, chosen uh, by this procedure with probability really close to one for all 20 data sets. X2 uh, has, um, is it's, a little harder for, uh, for uh, X2 to be picked up. Uh, so you have posterior probability, pro, uh, posterior inclusion probabilities that vary quite a bit, but most of them are close to, many of them I'd say are close to one. Now the other three covariates that are actually not in the model, 
uh, they have um, usually lower posterior probabilities, posterior inclusion probabilities. So that's good. And that's for tau equal to 0 0.01, which is like very, very high spatial dependence. When tau is 0.1, which is the usual level of spatial dependence that I see, then we don't have any problem detecting the uh, two important covariates. And the, the other covariates still, for most data sets, they, they have uh, posterior inclusion probabilities lower than 0.5. But some, for some data sets, they still should, are going to show up. Okay, and as we increase uh, tau, things kind of stabilize. Now, the probability of the spatial model, so if tau is 0 0.01, then the posterior probability of the spatial model for all data sets is pre pretty much one. If tau is 0.1, then the probability of the spatial model is for most data sets, it's very close to one. If tau is one, that's like weaker spatial dependence, then uh, we have a more uh, spread distribution for the probability of spatial, uh, for the posterior probability of the spatial model. And if the tau is infinite, so if, if we actually have independent data, then uh, the probability of spatial model, uh, given the data, uh, gets much smaller. If we increase the sample size to 400, then things look even better than for 100. And if we increase the sample size for 900, things get even better. So everything uh, goes in the, in the right direction as we increase the sample size. For our uh, FBF, based procedure with the uh, reference prior. <clears throat> now, this is the comparison with DIC and INLA. N equal to 100. Here and in green, we have the reference FBF. Oh, OK, so the, on the left, we have the probability of correct covariate structure. So we are, this is like the frequentest probability of correct covariate structure. Okay, as a function of tau c. Um, <clears throat> so we can see that for the reference FBF, that, that uh, probability of correct covariate structure is pretty high. And it usually grows a little bit as the dependence of the special random effects gets attenuated. For the uh, DIC and WAC, and these are DIC and WAC using the reference prior. So uh, the performance is much, much worse than the performance of this reference FBF. The probability of correctly identifying the spatial structure, um, our procedure uh, does much better than the um, DIC and, and WAC. This is even for n equal to 100. When n goes to 400, we can, we can just move this and you can see what happens. So our procedure gets better and better. And the reference DIC and the reference WAIC essentially don't move much. They don't get much better than what they were for n equal to 100. And they, the probability of actually identifying the correct spatial structure when the data are independent actually goes down. And same thing happens with n equal to 900. So when n is equal to 900, our procedure uh, has a very high probability of correctly identifying the covariate, stru uh, the covariate structure for all values of tau c. And this reference DIC and reference WIC, uh, they uh, don't, don't really get much better. And the <clears throat> in the, for the probability of correctly identifying the spatial structure, our procedure does a great job, whereas the reference DIC and the reference WAC actually get worse. And why do we think that that's the case? It's, well, one of the reasons I think is because uh, the reference DIC and the reference WAC are based 
on the estimated spatial random effects. So the random effects are not being integrated out for the computation of the, the, of the DIC and WAC. And that's mimicking what's done by um, our packages, INLA and CARBASE. They, they estimate the spatial random effects and they use those to compute the DIC and the WAC. So now let's go back to our uh, application logarithm of median household income in 2017. So this is the log of income of, uh, of income is our uh, dependent variable, log of population, log unemployment, and then indicators of large metropolitan area, indicator of medium metropolitan area, and indicator of small metropolitan area are, are the other regressors. So we have in total five regressors uh, not metropolitan area is the baseline. Uh, and here we consider three spatial dependent structures. No spatial dependence, hard model with ICAR spatial random effect, and a SAR model. Here the probability was the prior probability was split so that half of the prior probability went to no spatial dependence. One fourth went to the Zark co model with the ICAR spatial random effects, and one fourth went to the SAR model. <clears throat> These are the estimates. So um, we, can, uh, we can see that none of the 95% uh, credible intervals include the zeros. So it looks like these variables are uh, all important. And, and uh, tau is being estimated at 0 0.15, uh, 0 0.1560, uh, which indicates strong spatial dependence for the spatial random effects. Sigma squared is being estimated at like 0 0.0065. And then uh, when we apply our FBF based uh, posterior probability, that FF. FBF based posterior probability of the ICAR model, hierarchical model with the ICAR spatial, spatial random effects and with all five predictors is pretty much close to one. Okay, so, uh, so all five predictors should be included in the model and uh, we should use uh, a spatial random effects model. So the ICAR spatial random effects, the hierarchical model is the ICAR spatial random effects, but it's not only the independent model, but also the SAR model. And SAR models are widely used by econometricians. So our procedure gives a way of, you know, deciding should this be a hard model with like our special random facts, that's what statisticians usually like to use, or a SAR model, which is what econometricians like to use. And of course, for this data set, the, this hard model won, but I think in general, uh, would, uh, we would have da some data sets where this hard model would win and some other data sets where the SAR model would win. So some conclusions. So uh, here we propose an objective-based model selection for Gaussian hard models with ICAR random effects. And uh, we use here fractional base factors, the sum zero constraint ICAR, and then the reference prior for this Gaussian hierarchical models with uh, ICAR random effects. And uh, we also have uh, results that show that the use of the sum zero constraint ICAR random effects is equivalent to the use of the exact ICAR random effects. And one cool thing here is that there's, there, there's all this talk about spatial confounding, but it looks like our model selection method does not suffer from spatial confounding. Um, and finally, our method works very well and vastly outperforms the DAC and the WASC. Thank you very much. Okay, thank you for this really exciting talk. And any questions for Marco? Oh, yeah, Abel. So I guess I, I missed a little piece, uh, but uh, so I apologize if you kind of talked about this, but kind of one of the things that make 
me and many people kind of nervous around the fractional base factor is that it's sometimes inconsistent. Yes. And that, that is not coming out in your simulations and your simulations, it would appear like, like it's consistent. But I guess the question is, have you guys developed any theory to try to um, address this or, or give a kind of a more definite answer than just the simulations? Yeah, that's a great question. And uh, we don't, so the, the things that the fractional base factor is inconsistent if the training fraction grows with the sample size, okay? So in our case, the training fraction is fixed. So uh, there are results showing that the fractional base factor is consistent in that case. Okay, great. Other questions? So I'm just curious one thing. So when you define, so in your case, you need to define the neighbors, right? So are you just using the counties, the regular nearest, like the one level nearest neighbor, mm -hmm. or you also account, because I think some counties are larger and some counties are smaller. So when we think about the geometry of the neighbors, uh, neighbors, sorry. neighbors yeah. could be quite, it could be quite different. So I'm just curious about like, yeah, how yeah, to that, handle these situations. That's a great question. So what we did was um, we, used we first applied the um i think and b function in r to find the neighbors so if neighbors share a border then if, if counties share a border then they're neighbors okay uh so and then after that we found out that some counties did not have any neighbors and then uh, we looked at why that was the case and the case is the the issue is that these maps they are made not for the poly to NB function, right? They're made for other reasons. And then if there is a, a river between the counties and there are bridges between the counties, depending on how this, the spatial polygons are drawn, the counties are not going to touch, even though they are neighbors separated by a river, but their bridges correct. So what we do is we change a little bit the definition of neighborhood just so that if the if the borders for those counties right so if the borders were a little bit far away from each other we would still consider the counties neighbors okay nice. <laughs> thanks you're welcome um yeah, sometimes I was just thinking that when we define a neighbor in the spatial scenario if it's coming from like social economic related quantity I don't know, but it seems that maybe like if we have something like highway pathing to a couple of county, maybe that will have a stronger connection, but I never know how we can actually properly model that situation. So, so yeah, yeah, yeah. So it's just, just, yeah, some thoughts about that, yeah. Yeah, so, you know, so if, if we fit a linear model, uh, you know, just with the LM function, with the log income as the dependent variable and the other, the other covariances, well, the covariates, and then we plot the uh, a map with the residuals, we're going to see that there is a strong spatial dependence, clearly, okay. Yeah, so, um, yeah, and then, yep, so. Thanks. You're welcome. Yeah, Abel? So I don't want to monopolize the, the, the questions, but I guess uh, related to Jen Chi's question in some sense, uh, so there is this literature on wombling, the, the discrete the aerial wombling, uh, so Brad Carlin and, and company, where uh, in some sense you're doing model selection, but on the neighborhood the structure uh, to see if, for example, essentially you can put together two counties and call those two counties a single uh, special mm -hmm. area. Um, so, so it would seem that you could adapt what you're doing here uh, to, to address some of this wombling uh, questions. Um, so, yeah. so this is more of a suggestion than than a question. Is yeah, that maybe an interesting uh, direction to take it? Yeah, that's a very cool suggestion. I'm gonna pass that on to Erica Porter. <laughs> this is really cool idea. Thank you. Yes, yeah. So there are all sorts of things, right? That uh, that we may try, but this wombling thing is a, is a good thing. Is a, a very good idea. The other thing we can try is just like. What, can we uh, use a second order neighborhood structures? Because 
here we use a first order neighborhood structure, right? But then if we say neighbors uh, of neighbors are also neighbors, then we are going to have a second order neighborhood structure. And then we can possibly test, you know, add that as another possible um, option in this model selection procedure. And I'm not sure if, if our procedure would work well in that case, but I, I suspect it would did really well with the SAR uh, model because we, um, you know, usually you fit a car mod, you know, this hierarchical model with uh, a car random effect and you fit a SAR model. And then it's not trivial to distinguish between the two. But here, at least for this data set, that was not a problem at all. Yeah. How about a more general car with, um, you know, an, an spatial autocorrelation coefficient so that you are not in the proper case? So, okay, so the spatial correlation coefficient, so you would be in the proper case, right? Yes. So, um, so I have a paper with Victor de Oliveira in 2007 that has uh, a reference prior for a case similar to that, where we, uh, we consider a proper uh, car. But then, are you talking about the proper car as a model for the observations or still as a model for the spatial random effects? The spatial random effects. Oh, wow. Yes. Um, huh. I don't, I'm not sure how that would be. So we have a reference prior for a proper car when the proper car is used as a model for the observations. Okay. And then if you want to do model selection there, you could use this same procedure, use the FBF uh, using that reference prior that we proposed in that case. Now, when you use a proper car for uh, the spatial random effects, right, in a hierarchical model, then, then you have, you know, another an added layer. And uh, I'm not sure how complicated that would become. I'm not even sure what would be the reference prior in that case, you know. But that's also a good, good question. The things that <clears throat> with our sum zero constraints, I car uh, prior, then we, we have a proper car model, you see? It's just that it's a proper car model where the spatial random effects are constrained to sum to zero. So I would, I would actually recommend that instead of the uh, instead of the proper car, right? Uh, as a model for the spatial random effects. <clears throat> yeah. Great. <laughs> Any other questions? Okay, so if no more questions, then <laughs> let's thank Marco again for this really exciting talk and, and happy weekend and thank you all for participating. Thanks, Marco. Thank you. Thank you. Thanks. Thank, thank you. you, everybody. Thanks.